Hey guys, hope you're doing well. I wanted to uh, follow up on a few things uh, we've been discussing lately on the Reformation, on uh, the five solos of the Reformation, uh, the foundations of Reformed theology. Many times we, we think of Reformed theology as Calvinism or the five points of Calvinism, and, and, um, and certainly that's part of what it means to be Reformed historically. Uh, but we've gone down to the basics. We've gone down to the foundation of Reformed theology, which is the five solas of the Reformation, and, and really been trying to understand those in the context uh, in which they were first, um, or it, maybe it would be better to say most popularly uh, taught, clarified, expounded upon, uh, because we can go back to Eusebius and other early church fathers and and, and obviously to the scriptures themselves, uh, to find these solas. Um, but, uh, but in terms of their popular use, um, we, we, we must go to the reformers. We, we see uh, just the corruption of the Roman church and the need for reform. Um, and uh, it's worth remembering that they're called reformers, not starters or beginners, because they didn't come up with these things. They've recovered or uh, rediscovered uh, these glorious truths about Christ and about the gospel. And so we've been, we've been trying to deepen our appreciation uh, for those who have gone before us, for the, the work of the reformers, uh, for these truths that are, are, are really the bedrock of our faith and, and, um, and our understanding of who Christ is. We don't want to be arrogant and think that we're the first people to ever see something in Scripture when, when uh, for hundreds of years Christians and dwelt with the Spirit have been seeing the things that we've been seeing. And, and I would argue uh, most of the time with much more clarity. And so uh, we need to see who sh whose shoulders we're standing upon. And, um, and so we, we ended this past week with Solus Christos uh, and looked at him in what is called the Munis Triplex, a threefold office of Christ. And we had some sound issues. Uh, the sermon didn't actually get recorded. Uh, it was too damaged, uh, the audio and uh, one of the chords was messed up. Anyway, we don't have that recording, and I got a few of you asking if you if I could re-record it. I'm not going to re-preach that sermon and and, uh, and, and record that, uh, but I I did want to follow up and, and say a few things, and um, maybe one or two I said uh, Sunday, but also to expound further and to say some other things. And if you'll actually stay to the end of this video, I need to say something about the building if you're uh, a member of the church. Um, so regarding the, the solas of the Reformation, um, when the Bible is rediscovered by uh, many of the Reformers, I mean, after Wycliffe uh, translated it into the new in the New Testament into English, and then it was translated into German and other other languages. Uh, the people begin to study it; they begin to read it, um, and and you you hear things in the night in, in the fifteen twenties, like Luther saying, "Jesus Christ is the center and circumference of the Bible." Um, that that he's talking about in Christ's dying and rising. Uh, is the fundamental content of Scripture. So they're, they're, they're beginning to see this. You see Zwingling, the reformer in Switzerland, and, and he's saying Christ is the head of all believers uh, who are his body, and without him the body is dead. And so what they're, what they're uh, seeing with absolute clarity from the Scriptures themselves is that the Pope is not the head of the church. Christ is the head of the church. And... Uh, and they want to, they, they see the whole Bible, Old and New Testament, as centering and, and climaxing in the, the person and work of Christ. And, and then what we looked at Sunday was that, especially in, in what they call in Latin the munis triplex, uh, the threefold office of Christ is prophet, priest, and king. And, and so you see these early confessions that we went over the Heidelberg catechism which talks of Christ being the chief prophet the the high priest and the, and the king who governs us um, 
and and the Heidelberg was uh, was expounded upon and and really uh, given more clarity by Calvin and the Institutes. And in chapter fifteen, he he builds this out much uh, more thoroughly. But then even these early Baptist confessions, you know, we see the 1644. This is written by the Reformers slash Puritans. Um, it, it says the office of meteor, that is the prophet, priest, and king of the church of God, is proper to Christ. And and so these first re- Reformed confessions were that were baptistic were were not just saying we believe in Jesus who's the son of God who who died and rose again yes they were they were preaching and teaching many of those things uh all of those things but they were they were recognizing this threefold office of Christ that how he mediates for us how he gives redemption to us um and he does it by being a prophet a priest and a king and we see in the, in the second London Baptist in 1689, which is our elder statement of faith, um, the same teaching. We see also uh, in the, the New Hampshire Confession of Faith, which if, if you're a member uh, of the Cross Church um, or even thinking about joining, you need to read the New Hampshire Confession of Faith. Uh, that is our church statement of faith. And I would encourage you to read it often. It is a, a very good statement of faith. It's very readable. It's newer than, than the other statements of faith. Um, it's a Reformed Baptist statement of faith, but but less uh, detailed, uh, much less detailed than the 1689 London Baptist. But listen to how it talks about Christ being a prophet, priest, and king. It says, receiving the Lord Jesus Christ as our prophet, priest, and king and we are relying on him alone as the only and all-sufficient Savior. It's beautifully written uh, that he is the all-sufficient and only Savior in uh, his prophetic, priestly, and kingly office. And um, and then I, I recommended a book, and I'll just give a little recommendation here. This is by John Flavel. Uh, I, I, I think I told someone to Crossway published this. That's not... That's not actually true. Reformation Heritage published this a few years ago. It's very readable. Uh, it's not that long. Uh, what is it? It's about 100, 150 pages, but it goes into much more depth on Christ as prophet, priest, and king. And, you know, John Flavel, many people don't know, you know, he was a Puritan, a congregational Puritan, and uh, he, he, his, his writings are in the top three for sure, uh, Puritans to read. If you read Puritans, you need to read John Flavel. He was w- much more well known in his day than Thomas uh, Brooks, uh, than than Richard Baxter, than many of the ones that that many people are familiar with. Um, but uh, but John Flavel is, is an incredible author. He, you know, devotionally he 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 gets to your heart. He speaks to the heart, but he's also polemical. And, um, and, and how he writes. And so he, he wrote this about the offices of Christ. He said, Christ is revealed as a prophet. He purchased as a priest and he applied as a king's, that is salvation. In vain, it is revealed, that is salvation, if it is not purchased. In vain, it is revealed and purchased if not applied. And so what he's arguing is that each office of Christ is dependent on the other and uh, we, we could never have Christ as a king if he was not first a prophet and a priest. And that the prophetic and the priestly role of Christ uniquely qualifies him uh, for the kingly office. And I tried to argue this uh, Sunday. Uh, we got into Hebrews and, um, and, and tried to see that this is the, the bedrock of, of the, the author of Hebrews, his argument. Um, is that Christ is prophet. He says long ago, many times in many ways, God spoke to us through the prophets, but now in these last days, he's spoken to us by his son. And so clearly showing that Christ is the prophet of prophets. He is the speaker of God. Uh, he, he, he stands and, and as it were, God literally speaks through him. That, that was true of the prophets. Uh, how much more so of Christ? Uh, especially in these last days. And and so the book starts off with Christ as prophet, and then uh, the line of reasoning that the author of Hebrews gives 
is uh, that he is a priest after the order of Melchizedek, which is very unique and important. And then that priestly office that's in the order of Melchizedek, and Melchizedek was uh, had no in, beginning or end. He was a king of righteousness and of peace, it says. And he, uh, he is priest forever. He is priest forever. And Abraham was giving tithes to him. Melchizedek is, is from chapter 5 to 10 in Hebrews is, is dedicated to this long, drawn-out argumentation about the importance of Christ being a, a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. And I, I wish I could just go way more in depth on that. Um, but Hebrews does, and you can read that in chapters 5 through 10. And it's glorious because uh, the argumentation is, is very thorough and, and very careful to say that the Son of God comes from the order of Melchizedek. And also something important to remember here uh, is that New Testament authors quoted Psalms 110 more than any other Old Testament passage. It is the most quoted Old Testament passage in the New Testament. Psalms 110, where it says uh, he is a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek, that is Christ. And Melchizedek, again, he was a high priest who had no beginning or end, and his, uh, his office of priesthood was not the Levitical priesthood. It was before the Levitical priesthood. He came. He was with Abraham, remember? That was that before Moses. Uh, so he's before the Levitical priesthood, before Aaron's line of priests. So it's not by blood or descendant. But uh, it is an eternal priesthood. And it says the Son of God is a priest like that, only more so, in that type of order, because he's king and he's priest. And then, it, and then the, the line of argumentation ends with, but he's a priest who lays down his own life. This priest becomes the sacrifice, once and for all sacrifice for sin. It's just glorious. Spend a lot of time in, in Hebrews 5 through 10 thinking about the, the, the priestly work of Christ. It's, it's absolutely amazing. And, it, and then here's the connection that Hebrews makes, that after making purification for sins, which is what Christ did as priest, it says he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And so his priestly work, uniquely qualifies him for the kingly work that he does, ruling and reigning the hearts of his people. And to go back to uh, to go back to Flavel again, he's helpful here uh, on this. And let me find the, the quote from him. Um, he, he divides Christ's kingly work into uh, a, a, a spiritual and a providential. Or, or you could say internal and external uh, kingdom. So the internally, he's ruling and reigning the hearts of his people, bringing us into joyful submission to Christ so that we gladly call him Lord and we live uh, for the glory of his kingdom. Uh, that, so there's that element to his king, kingly rule. And then the other element of his kingly rule uh, is what he, he would call the providential or external, that he guides and orders uh, all the world in what he calls the blessed subordination to the eternal salvation of his people. So he's working all things in the universe toward God's ultimate glory and his God's people's ultimate good. And then we just see the power of his rule and reign uh, when we see miracles, his, his power over creation, that he's speaking to storms and telling them to be still. He's speaking to diseases and sicknesses, and they're fleeing people. And we just see the, the, the absolute sovereignty and, 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 and providential rule of Christ over all things, all things, uh, especially the church. And Psalms 2 is a glorious place to go to see the rule of Christ and how the nations hate him. Um, people really do hate Christ. They do. And, and God is not thrown off by this or surprised by this. It says in Psalms uh, chapter 2 that the nations rage and the peoples, listen to this, they plot in vain. And the kings of the earth, it says, set themselves, the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. And listen to what they say. 
let us burst their bonds and cast their cords from us. What are they saying? They're saying, uh, we don't want the rules. We don't want the rule of Christ. We don't want the reign of Christ in our lives. We don't want his law. And that's, that is our, the world we live in. Uh, it hates the rule of Christ. It hates the reign of Christ. Uh, but God's people, he has given us a heart to love his rule and to love his reign and to bring us into joyful submission uh, to him. And uh, what a privilege it is. What a privilege it is. Uh, to be able to come to Christ, to approach his throne of grace, to receive mercy and help in our time of need. You know, I, I shared Sunday how I met with this director of development the other day at this very large church up north. And he he was a politician by his own profession. Uh, he, he, he said he was. He was. He's at the White House lobbying all the time. And um, he had garnered all these government grants to do local ministry in their community and it, it's great you know but i walked away from that two-hour meeting uh after meeting with that man and, and basically the advice that i was given is you need to learn how to rub shoulders with the right people you need to make the right connections politically in your locally or or, or at the state level to get the funding needed to do the ministry needed in your community and there's probably truth in that at some level um at many levels, I'm sure that that's true. But I, I walked out of there comforting myself, thinking this man doesn't know who I know. Uh, I know the leader above the politicians. I know the, the governor of the governors. And, um, and I can approach him and do approach him for all of my needs uh, that advance his kingdom. And obviously, if we sit there and we spend our time praying for silly, superficial things, maybe we don't always get those. But when we pray for kingdom advancing things, God glorifying things, things that are according to his will, uh, we will have what we ask of him. We will. And uh, his, his kingly rule is glorious. And so seeing Christ as uh, solus Christos, as prophet, priest, and king, that munis triplex is, is a glorious lens in which to see Christ. And it really is uh, the way he's laid out in the totality of Scripture. And so um, I hope that uh, moving forward we can, we can think glorious and great and true thoughts about Christ because uh, we do not start with how we feel about Christ. We start with what is true about Christ. What does the scripture actually reveal about the person and work of Christ? And, and, and he is the prophet and the priest and the king. Now, if you've listened this far, um, I, uh, I thank you for that. Um, uh, and I, I want to just say quickly about our building situation. Um, we uh, we are, are making great progress. And, and let me frame this because uh, for 13 years we haven't had a building. Maybe some of you listening are new and don't, don't know the story. I won't tell it now. But for 13 years we haven't had a building and, 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 and it's been glorious and we've loved it. And, and there's been challenges to it for sure. But um, especially this last two years, uh, been been moved over all over the place with different places we've met and times we've met outside inside all this but but the Lord's finally provided us a building and it's uh it's an it's an amazing gift he's given us and we want to steward it well and and so we've uh not only it's in our possession now we've purchased it uh 42,000 square foot uh building uh right off of Palafox uh right near the interstate there just perfect location in our estimation and there's work to do and we're trying to do as much of that in-house as possible. But, um, but guys, here, why this matters is because Christ must be known in this city and in the nations. He must. We, we must advance this cause of Christ because uh, there are, this city is people are dead to Christ. They don't know him. They haven't heard him. They don't know he's prophet, priest, and king. And they need him to be. They, they need him to be the, the truth teller. They're, they're, they're blinded by lies. They're in bondage to lies. 
They need someone to come and tell them truth to cut through uh, the the ideological biases and ignorance uh, which enslave most people in this country. They need a prophet. Uh, they need a priest. They need someone to right all their wrongs and to make them pure and holy before God. Uh, and they need a king. They need someone to rule them, to govern their lives. To uh, uh, They need a shepherd king. They need someone like David, only greater than David, uh, to, to rule them and to provide for all of their needs. And that unique person is Jesus Christ. And we want to offer him to our city. And God has given us a building to bring people in, to do a counseling ministry, to do many outreach, to, to hold services and, and have the high praises of God on our, on our lips. And so I just appeal to you guys to come up there when we do these work days on Saturdays from 8 to, to 12, to be up there helping. Uh, many of you have. I know some of you want to get out there. It is your heart to, to come and help us and you haven't been able to yet. This is an opportunity to serve Christ's church. And it is, a, it is an honor and privilege to do so. And this is, a, this is a, a unique time in the life of our church where we need physical labor. We need walls painted and floors put down and ceiling tiles taken out and drywall taken out. And, 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 and there's still much work to do. And we need everyone's help uh, to do it. And uh, we want to hire out some of it, but we want that to be as minimal as possible to save the church money so that we can give to things that we really want to give to uh, rather than all of, all of the money that we have going into to these repairs that we could actually do ourselves. And so uh, a lot of progress has been made. I'm, I'm honestly very excited about how much progress has been made. Um, we do not have a timeline on, on how quickly we'll be in the building. Um, you know, I'm hopeful by the beginning of the year, but I, I don't see that it's probably going to happen. It just, it depends on uh, some of the construction uh, team that's doing the roof and, and, and doing the air conditionings and how quickly they're able to do that uh, will dictate how quickly we can get to some of the other issues that are contingent on that. So see, see Ron um, if you have questions and want to help. Uh, there'll be information posted, uh, but show up on these Saturdays. Uh, for these work days, and then even in the, the this week, I think some nights, some men are going up there and working. We got a lot knocked out last night, actually. Um, it was a, it was a good night of work. <sighs> Guys, love y'all, and um, excited going forward that we get to worship Christ together and live for His glory. Uh, may the Lord help us in that. I'll talk to y'all later. Bye.